Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coulton. And starring two of radio's foremost personalities, Lyle Sudro and Robert Dunley, in Behind the Locked Door. This is a mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and kill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as I bring you the strange and chilling stories so many of you have asked to hear again. I call it Behind the Locked Door. Our story begins in the beautiful mountain region of Lake Mead, Arizona. A convertible car is speeding along a deserted road which winds through the mountains. The car slows down, turns into a dirt road. A few minutes later, it comes to a stop before a small mountain lodge. Kathy Evans, an attractive girl in her early 20s, gets out of the car, runs up the steps of the lodge to the front door. She knocks impatiently, looking about anxiously. Yes? Martin. Kathy. I thought I'd find you here. Aren't you going to ask me? No and... way, Kathy. Martin, what's wrong? Go away. You? Go away. Not until I find out what this is all about. Well, let me in. Are you alone? Alone? Yes. Darling, look mm. at yourself. You haven't shaved in uh, days. And... Martin, those deep gashes on your face. How did you get them? It doesn't matter. Darling, you must have lost a great deal of blood. And your fever. Yes, I know. Is it true about Professor Stevens? Yes. Why did you leave town so suddenly last night? The authorities are looking for you. Do they know I'm here? No. How could they? It was intuition that brought me here. They must have found me. Martin, Mm. nothing makes sense. Mm. You return from an expedition last night alone, unexpected. You stay in town one hour and then vanish. Not even phoning me. It's best that way. Believe me, Kathy. You've got to tell me everything that's happened. I can't, Kathy. I can't. I'm your fiancé. I've got a right to know. Kathy, go away, please. I won't go away until you tell me what's happened. If I do, then will you go? Yes. I... I don't know where to begin. I suppose if you can say it had a beginning. It it was that day a little over two weeks ago in Professor Stevens' office. Come in, Martin. Come in. Have a seat. Thank you, Professor. Martin, how would you like to go exploring with me for, say, ten days, two weeks at the outside? Exploring where? There's a million cliffs along the Colorado River. I found some wonderful Aztec pieces there last summer. One large cave I stumbled on proved to be a veritable treasure trove. Yes, yes, I've seen those Aztec pieces in the University Museum. Now, the Vermilion Cliffs still remain largely unexplored. I'm sure that we could turn up many more objects of interest. <laughs> it certainly sounds intriguing. The only reason I hesitate, Professor, is because of Kathy. I'm sure she'd give you a two-week leave of absence. (laughs) Yes, I suppose so. How many of us would go? Well, it would just be you, myself, and an Indian guide. And three burrows. I find that the fewer there are on expedition, the better. Mm -hmm. When would we leave? Well, what about the day after tomorrow? All right, Professor, I'm with you. So these are the Vermilion Cliffs, Professor. Yes. An awe-inspiring sight, I think. Yeah, they're as breathtaking as the Grand Canyon itself. 
I have no idea they towered so high. Yes, they make you realize just how insignificant man really is. Yeah. Now, this region is so desolate, Martin, that it's all but unexplored. That's why I'm drawn to it time and time again. Yes, I can understand that. It represents the challenge of the unknown. <laughs> Careful, Martin, you'll get the exploring bug. Oh, I've already been bitten, Professor. Well, if you're going to be an explorer and an archaeologist, I'll have to start teaching you the fundamentals of the profession. Dan, this seems like a good spot. We'll camp here for the night. Phew. Well, it certainly is hot, Professor. Exploring isn't as easy as I thought. Yeah. All right, Professor, what is it? For 20 minutes now, you've been sitting on that rock staring at that cliff. Yeah. Note the boulders strewn over the face of that cliff. What about them? Well, that's a very peculiar landslide. If you carefully study the formation of it, What's peculiar about it? Many of the rocks look as though they'd been placed there by human hands. <laughs> but why and by whom? Well, one of the ancient Aztec forms of punishment was to steal a person in a cave by means of a landslide or just piling heavy rocks in front of the mouth of the cave. Yeah. That landslide, there must be hundreds of tons of rock there. Yes. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we're prepared for it. Is that why you brought the dynamite along? Yes. <laughs> Probably all we'll find will be a skeleton. In that case, it'll have been a waste of dynamite. However, we'll chance it. Oh, Sam. What do you want? Get the case of dynamite, Sam. I'm going to blast that landslide. Professor. Got to leave it same way it be. Why? Evil spirit sleep in cave. Better not wake him up. <laughs> You really believe that, Martin? I wouldn't laugh. Sam may be uneducated, but he senses things that you and I can't even begin to comprehend. Well, now, wait a minute. You mean you believe what he said about evil being asleep in that cave? I wouldn't say that I believe it. But nevertheless, I respect Sam's opinion. But Sam, I still want to blast that landslide. Hey. Get dynamite. Keep your head down, Martin. When I set that dynamite off, there are going to be a great many rocks flying around. Don't worry, Professor. I've got cover. Sam, you ready? Yes, Professor. All right. Here goes. <laughs> Keep your head down. All right. It's safe now. Professor, I think you did it. I can see a small opening. It looks like a mouth of a cave. Yes, it is. Sam, let me have one of the flashlights. Martin, you take the other. Uh, I'll lead the way in. Just as you say, Professor. Yeah, it doesn't seem too bad in here. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it, what's that noise? It's just rats scurrying around. Oh. Certainly a huge cavern. Look at that ceiling. Must be 200 feet high. Look at the bats up there. Yeah, it's huge ones. I have a feeling that this cavern and others extend for miles underground. Yeah, I... Professor, look. Tell us, Yes. There's, there's another one over there. Yes. Let's see what else there is. Wagon train. What? Good Lord. Sam's right. It's a wagon train. A wagon train? Yes. But there are at least 30 or 40 wagons in this cavern. Look. Skeletons of horses. Yes. Here's a skeleton with an arrow beside it. Let me see it. Appears to be a Navajo arrow. What do you think, Sam? Navajo. Professor, this... This flag train, what's it all mean? Well, many years ago, this wagon train was attacked by Indians. Wagon train retreated into this cavern. 
hoping to save themselves that way. And then the Indians caused a landslide, sealing them in. Yeah. Poor devils. Look, notice that old gun lying there. Yeah. The flintlock seems to suggest this wagon train must be at least a hundred years old. Yeah, probably headed for the California gold rush of 1848. Yeah. Well, we'll come back tomorrow and search this wagon train thoroughly. I'm sure we'll find many things of great interest. The next morning, after an early breakfast, Sam and I followed Professor Stevens back into the cabin. We spent the morning investigating the trunks and boxes we found on the wagons. And among the moldy clothing and 101 household articles, we found faded letters and newspapers which showed the wagon train had crossed the Mississippi in the summer of 1849. Headed west for California and gold. We finished rummaging among the effects of the wagons. And the professor suggested we explore the cavern. We followed him from one cavern to another, each varying in size. Now and then the professor would stop to mark our trail, for the caverns were honeycombed with countless passageways. How far do you think we've come, Professor? I should say we're about a mile from the wagon train. Huh? We'll go back a few more minutes. We'll go back now. This place evil. Now, Sam, if there are ghosts here, there's only the ghosts of the people in the wagon train. They wouldn't harm us. I tell you, evil. Feel it. All around. We'll go back. We'll go just a little further. And turn back. Yes, Professor, wait a minute. What is it, Martin? Oh, I think I hear running water. Yes, you're right. Come along. We seem to be getting closer. Yeah, yeah. You will all around us. Can't be much further. Well, there it is. Yeah. It's a small river. <laughs> Look how swiftly it's flowing. Yeah. It probably flows for miles underground and it empties into the Colorado River. Say, hey, Professor, here along the bank, there's a tremendous pile of fish bones. Yes, yeah, so there is. Look. Well, there are even more on the other side of the river. Mm. What do these huge piles of fish bones mean? It's very strange. Well, how do you account for it? I'm afraid that it's a moment I can't. Sam, you any ideas about it? Evil all around us. I feel him strong. Professor, he's trembling. Sam, there's nothing to be afraid of. Look, I'll shine my flashlight around. See? We've been watched. Watched? What are you talking about? One stay here. I go. Sam, come back. You haven't even got a flashlight. Sam! Come on, Mark. We've got to catch him. <laughs> Sam! Wait for us. I can still hear his footsteps. We've got to catch him. He did himself a serious injury running in the dark like that. Sam! Wait for us. <laughs> Professor, it's Sam. Scream it. This way. That fool's probably broken his leg. Oh, that sounds more like a fight. I do think he's fighting with his fighting way. I don't know. He stopped. Sam, where are you? Keep shining the flashlight around. Oh. Can't be much further. Sam! There he is. Yes. He's just... Just sitting against that boulder. His head down. Yes. Sam, give me a hand with the lamp. Good Lord. His face. Nick. Yes. I have a theory. But it's so incredible that I can't bring myself to voice it. Tell me. What do you think I'm insane? Tell me. What if the people of the wagon train, or rather the descendants, are alive here in these huge caverns? Well, that's impossible. Why? Picture what happened the day the 150 people or so were sealed into this mountain by the Indians. What would have been the first thing they'd have done? Try to dig their way out. Exactly. They start digging and find there are 100-ton boulders blocking the entrance, and they have no dynamite. 
They're forced to give up. Yes. They spend days looking for another way out. Fail to find one. The day comes when all their food is gone. Starvation sets in. All right, all right. Then that would mean they would all die. Not necessarily. The strongest of them stumble along in the darkness and find the underground river. They catch an abundance of fish and are able to survive. The huge fishbone piles along the river. Right. The river was an everlasting supply of food. They continue to live by the river in the dark. Some probably went insane, died. Others adjusted themselves to their new environment. Professor, you... You think those handful of survivors had descendants who are alive today inside this mountain? Yes, Martin. And it was one of them who clawed sand to death. What can those descendants be like? Being born and, and, and living in darkness? I can only guess. I should imagine they'd be blind or near to it. But their other senses would be remarkably developed. Their physical appearance. I don't know. Oh, gee. It's all like a nightmare. A nightmare you can't awaken from. What, what's to prevent them from attacking us? And our flashlights, for one thing. I'm sure light frightens them, just as fire frightens animals. Fortunately, I have a revolver. Well, we better move on. Wait a minute. What about Sam? There's nothing we can do for him now. Come along, Martin. We must find the trail I marked so that we can get out of here. Uh, seems we've been searching days for the markings you left. Yes. Actually, it's been ten hours. Listen, what? The river. Yes. Yeah. Come along. Yeah. Once we reach the river, we'll be able to pick up the trail I'm on. Well, we're getting closer. Yes. There it is. Here we are. Look, Martin, there's my marking on the passageway. We found the trail. Yes. Martin, 2 a.m. We'd better rest for a few hours. We're both too exhausted to go on right now. One of us stand guard, and the other sleeps. All right. Well, I'll set up the first hour. Thank you, Martin. Keep the flashlight on. Don't worry. I will. In a matter of minutes, the professor fell asleep and I sat on guard, flashing my light slowly around the huge cavern. I looked at my watch, and the seconds seemed like minutes, and the minutes like hours. My eyes grew heavy, and I finally dozed off. Suddenly, I awakened in the darkness to hear the professor scream. Help me! Help me! Shut all the flashlights! Frank and foolishly, I stumbled in the darkness, but I couldn't find it. Then suddenly, they were shot. Then I could see the professor struggling with a huge, dark figure. And suddenly all was quiet. Except for the professor's moans. As I crawled toward him, in the darkness, my hand struck the flashlight. I turned it on, and there was the professor. Martin, I think I'm wounded. You're, you're bleeding badly. Let me stanch you. Wounds. Relate. Leave at once. At one. But what about you? Professor? Professor! I felt his heart, but there was no beat. I staggered to my feet, shined my flashlight around until I found the professor's markings. I stumbled wearily along the marked passageway, trying not to remember my last glimpse of the professor's face. I hadn't gone more than a hundred yards when suddenly my flashlight flickered and went out. As I stood alone in the darkness, rats scampering past, I fought to keep from screaming. The darkness seemed to become heavier and more oppressive with each passing moment, and I had the feeling something was silently approaching. I backed 
up against the passage wall and waited, my eyes straining in the darkness, and then suddenly I was leaped upon by a wild fury. I threw my arms up and raised them and tried to break my face and neck. Again and again, I tried to savage the heart to sigh, and I could feel the blood streaming down my face and neck. And then suddenly the deathly clawing ceased as my attacker turned to ward off something in the dark. As I sank to my knees, I was dimly aware of a fierce fight taking place, and then consciousness left me. Later. How much later, I have no way of knowing. I became aware of a heavy, calloused hand washing my face and neck with water. I winced in pain as the water flowed into the deep cuts, and then suddenly I remembered all. And remembering all, became aware of the calloused hand washing my face and the presence of someone beside me in the darkness. Who are you? For a moment, the hand hesitated, then resumed washing the neck. Well, can't you speak? Say something! The noise came from its throat that was more of that of an animal than a human being. If, if I could only see you, do you have a name? It spoke. It seemed to repeat the word name, though I couldn't be sure. And faint from the loss of blood, I closed my eyes and fell asleep. When I awoke, my face and neck felt stiff and painful. It seemed to sense I was awake, for as I opened my eyes and stared into the darkness, it came to my side. Can't you understand anything at all? Don't my words make any sense to you? Why did you save my life? My hand brushed against its hand. And I could feel the sharp, claw-like fingers on it. I reached out in the darkness as I touched its face. It bit my hand. <clears throat> I tried to get to my feet, but... It placed a strong hand on my shoulder and held me down. At that moment, I realized that not only was it my savior, but my jailer as well. I lost all track of time. Now and then, it would leave me. And I would cautiously get to my feet to steal off, but no sooner had I taken more than a few steps than it would be there at my side, forcing me to return to the bank of the river. I spent my every waking moment trying to think of a way to escape. And then, when my despair was greatest, an idea came to me. The professor had said that the underground river I lay beside emptied into the Colorado River. Though the odds were a hundred to one against my surviving, I knew it was the only possible way of escape. Slowly, I crawled a few remaining feet to the edge of the river and, leaning over, started to wash my face. I could sense that it was watching me. I leaned forward a few inches more and fell into the river. As I came up for air in the swift flowing water, I heard a splash beside me. A moment later, I felt its arms around me. The current swept us along with breathtaking speed, and as we clung to each other, I discovered that it couldn't swim. For what seemed hours, the river swept us along in the darkness, and I felt myself losing consciousness as I attempted to keep the two of us above water. When I regained consciousness, Kathy, we were both lying on a sandbar in the Colorado River, and the sun was beating down on us. Darling, you're delirious from your wound. You need a doctor. I wish. I wish it were simple as all that. You're feverish. You need care. No. Go away, Kathy. Go away. How can I? Leaving you alone like this? Don't you understand? I'm not alone. She's here. 
She's it? Yes. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? It turned out to be a she. You're out of your mind. You don't know what you're saying. I first saw her that first time. Lying unconscious on that sandbar, my first instinct was to leave her there. But how could I? She had saved my life in the cavern and then jumped into the river when she thought I was drowning, even though she couldn't swim herself. Martin, I want you to get a grip on yourself. Just as I was dependent on her in the dark, she's dependent on me in the light. She's blind. She can't speak yet. She... <laughs> Talking like that. <laughs> you can't believe it's true, can you, Kathy? Neither could I at first. What are you staring at? Huh? Is there anyone in that bedroom? Huh? Well, I'll soon find out. Why is the door locked? She's in there. Martin, you're sick. You don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I'll prove to you there's no one in that room. It's just your imagination. Give me the key to the door. Kathy, Kathy, give it to me. Thank you. Perhaps when you see the room is empty, you'll be willing to return to town for medical treatment. There. I told you. Serious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? What's that, madam? You want a description of what Kathy saw when she opened that bedroom door? Well, you might ask Kathy. But the only trouble is, the poor girl gets hysterical when you question her about the occupant of that bedroom. I suggest you write a letter to the Museum of Horrors for a full description. They consider the woman of the mountain as their star exhibit. Because when she... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler. You may now enjoy other exciting adventures of The Mysterious Traveler in the current issue of The Mysterious Traveler magazine. In our cast, Lyle Sudro, Anne Shepard, and Robert Donnelly with Maurice Trapple in the title role. Phil Tonkin speaking. This program came to you from New York. Mutual's ace commentator Cecil Brown, currently on a three-month fact-finding tour of the world, heads for the Orient on the last lap of his history-making trip. In these last weeks, Mr. Brown will bring you on the on-the-scene reports from such tinderbox areas as India, Hong Kong, Hawaii, Japan, and Honolulu. You won't want to miss any of the eyewitness accounts by this able commentator, of the latest happenings in these headline-making spots of the world. Be sure to listen to the news reports of Cecil Brown over most of these stations. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will... Thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back. Get a good grip on your nerves. I hope it's not making you nervous, being alone with me here in the dark. Darkness stirs strange terrors in some minds, particularly those of children. For children live in a world of their own, a world far removed from that of adults. 
Who among us knows the psychology of the child mind with its devious thoughts and actions? As in the tale of The Good Die Young. Years ago, when I was practicing medicine, I brought a child into the world. A girl who was named Sandra. In the years that followed, she grew into an extremely beautiful and clever child. But my story begins the day that Martha, the housekeeper, was finishing her duties for the last time. Sandra, come in here. I want to see you. Sandra! Were you calling me Martha? Yes. I told you to come right home after school. Where have you been? Oh, I'm sorry, Martha. I didn't hear you tell me to come home right after school. I'm sorry. Truly, I am. Save your acting for your father, young lady. It hasn't fooled me for a long time. Sandra, since your mother died, you're becoming more and more of a problem every day. Well, at least after tonight, I won't have to put up with your lies and your thousand and one little tricks. What do you mean, Martha? Your father won't be needing a housekeeper anymore. I'm leaving tonight. But why? Well, I'm not supposed to tell you. But you may as well know now as later. Your father is bringing home a new mother for you tonight. A new mother? Yes, he's just married again. But I don't want a new mother. Daddy and I don't need anyone else. We're happy the way we are. Sandra, stop screaming. I won't have it, do you hear? I won't have it. Your new mother's a very fine woman. I met her last night. I hate her. I hate her. Daddy's mine and no one else's. She hasn't any right to him. If you don't stop that screaming, I'll tell your father when he comes home tonight. Oh, no, no, no. Don't do that. I'll be good. But I hate her and I always will. I'll never... Stop That's a fine way to talk. Perhaps I ought to warn the poor woman about Sandra. Well, then it's none of my business. Besides, she'll find out about her soon enough. Stephen, <laughs> it's ridiculous you're carrying me across the threshold. All right, darling. It's tradition in my family to carry the bride over the threshold. <laughs> there you are. Oh. Oh. oh, Stephen, what a lovely house. Mm -hmm. Oh, you haven't seen the best part of it yet. Sandra. Do you think she'll like me, Stephen? I do so want her to. Of course she will. Perhaps you should have told her about us instead of breaking it to her so unexpectedly like oh, this. Oh, nonsense, Helen. I know my daughter. She's wonderful, child. And she'll fall madly in love with you at the first sight, just as her father did. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, where are you? Daddy. Daddy, you're home early. Oh, I'm so glad. How are you, darling? Oh, Daddy. <laughs> um, I have a surprise for you. A surprise? Mm-hmm. Sandra, this is Helen. Helen, I want you to meet my daughter, Sandra. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Darling, the uh, surprise I just mentioned is Helen. We were married this afternoon. That means that Helen is now your mother. Oh, Daddy, that's wonderful. Now I'll have a mother just like all the other girls do. Oh, I'm so glad. So am I, Sandra. And I'm sure we're all going to be very happy together. Of course we are. That night... After the family had said goodbye to Martha and seen her off, Sandra was sent to bed. She lay quietly in the darkness, thinking. Occasionally, she would speak softly to her doll, Barbara. She hasn't any right being here, Barbara. Daddy and I were perfectly happy until she came along. Tonight, he didn't even notice me. Just kept looking at her. Well, she shan't have him. He's always been mine, and he always will be. There. That's enough of that. Now, let me see... time this afternoon, I've asked you not to pound the keys that way. 
That's no way to play. I'm sorry, Mother. It's not only the piano, dear. There are many other little things. You pay no attention when I speak to you about them. I don't mean to do them, Mother. I just forget. Well, please try to remember, dear. Now, I want you to play the piano as you did last night for Daddy. He was very pleased. Yes, Mother. I thought I asked you to stop pounding the piano like that. But, Mother, I was just composing a new piece for Daddy. Well, that wasn't music, Sandra, but just noise. That'll be enough for today. Hello, beautiful. How are you, darling? Uh, well... I wasn't sending her at the door to meet me. She's all right, isn't she? Oh, of course, dear. Uh, Stephen. Hmm? I was a bit angry with Sandra this afternoon. Angry with Sandra? Why, what'd she do? Well, several times this afternoon I had to speak to her about pounding the piano, being loud and discordant. Oh, well, that isn't like Sandra. You know how well she plays. Yes, of course. That wasn't the way she played today. Well, I'll go up and see her. All right. Uh, supper will be ready soon. All right, Ellen. <laughs> well, Sandra, what's this? <laughs> oh, Daddy, Daddy. Well, what's wrong? <laughs> You'll never cry. I was only trying to compose a new piece for your birthday next month. A new piece for my birthday? <laughs> yes. I wanted to surprise you. Oh, there, there, dear. <laughs> you mustn't cry. I'm sure, Mother, I understand you didn't mean to be bad. Now, here, let me wipe your tears. Oh, Daddy, I love you so. I just wanted to compose something wonderful for you. I understand, darling. Oh, Daddy... You always understand. Is supper ready, dear? Mm-hmm. Where's Sandra? She'll be down in a minute. Helen. Yes, Stephen? She really didn't mean to pound on the piano and get on your nerves. It's just she was trying to compose a new piece for me. Stephen, it wasn't music. It was just noise. Well, you mustn't be harsh with her. You know what children are like in their enthusiasm. They forget what they're told. But, Stephen... I don't know exactly what to say. It's just a question of being patient with her. Winning her love. All right, Stephen. Perhaps I was a bit impatient with her. You know I want nothing more than for the three of us to be happy together. I know that, darling. And the three of us will be happy together. In the weeks that followed, Helen tried to overlook Sandra's slamming of doors, and constant droppings of objects, and other nerve-wracking incidents. In time, she felt, Sandra would come to accept her love and guidance. It was just a matter of patience. Sandra? Is that you? Yes, Mother. Please sit down, dear. I want to talk to you. All right, but do hurry. Daddy will be home soon. Sandra, every day I've been giving you milk money for school. Why haven't you been buying milk with that money? But I have been, Mother. Now, please, Sandra, I won't punish you. I just want to know what you've been doing with that money. I've been buying milk with it. Please, Sandra. Mrs. Gordon, your teacher, told me you haven't bought milk for almost a month now. But I have. She just doesn't Sandra? have to... I won't have you lying to me. Now, that's your father. We'll see what he has to say about this. <laughs> you don't understand. You just don't understand. Stephen? Hello, oh, Sandra, what are you crying about? I'm sorry, Stephen, but Sandra's been misbehaving. Hmm? I think you'd better speak to her. You just don't understand. <laughs> 
What's she done, Ellen? <laughs> Mrs. Gordon, her teacher, told me today that for the past month, Sandra hasn't been buying milk with her milk money. Is that true, Sandra? And what's worse, Stephen, when I asked Sandra about it, she lied and said that she had been buying milk at school. Why, Sandra, it isn't like you to lie about things. I didn't mean to lie about it. I just wanted to keep it a surprise. <laughs> what a surprise? Your, your birthday present. Oh? I, I saved my milk money so that I could buy you a pipe. It's here in this box. Sandra, you know I'd have given you money to buy a birthday present for Daddy. It isn't the same thing. I wanted to buy him a present with my own money. Oh, I'm sorry, Sandra. Well, you might have told me about it when I asked you. And then it wouldn't have been a real surprise. I did want to surprise Daddy, so... But you have, darling. This is a beautiful pipe. No. The surprise is spoiled. Your birthday isn't till tomorrow. Well, this is much better, darling. It means I'll be able to smoke this pipe tonight. <laughs> oh, now, please stop trying. You go upstairs and wash your face and hands, huh? Uh, all right, Daddy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Stephen. But I had no idea what she'd done with the money. And she did lie when I asked her about it. Well, if you don't have a little more faith in her, Helen, I know it's difficult to understand her ties, but that's because as a child she looks at things differently. I'm sorry, Stephen. If you think I've failed with her. Oh, but you haven't, Helen. I'm sure that in time she'll come to love you as much as she loves me. I don't know, Stephen. I often wonder about that. As the weeks went by, Helen found herself coming no closer to winning Sandra's confidence. It wasn't that Sandra was unfriendly, but there was an air of reserve about her, which vanished only in her father's presence. Helen felt Stephen watching her anxiously when Sandra was about and sought to reassure him. Her one thought was to preserve their happiness. Hello, Helen. Hello, dear. Well, what happened to that vase, dear? Sandra broke it. Oh? Huh? Well, accidents will happen. Stephen, this is the fourth piece she's broken in two weeks. And each of them were pieces I've treasured, had for years. Well, Helen, you sound as though Sandra had deliberately broken those vases because they were yours. Well, why is it that only my things are broken? Oh, Helen, surely you don't believe she's deliberately breaking your things. I don't know what to believe. The first few times I thought it was an accident, but now... But Helen... Oh, please, Stephen, let's not quarrel. Perhaps I'm wrong. I admit I haven't any proof. It's, it's just all the little things adding up. Helen, what are you talking about? Oh, you wouldn't understand even if I told you. Where's Sandra? In her room, I suppose. Well, I'll go up and see what she's doing, huh? All right. Sandra, it's Daddy. Are you in your room? It's huh. funny. She isn't here. Hello, what's this? A note addressed to me. Dear Daddy, I'm sorry about the broken vase. Tried my best to be a good girl, but everything I do seems wrong. I make Mother very unhappy, so I'm running away. I love you very much and always will. Your daughter, Sandra. <laughs> After searching vainly for an hour in the dark and cold, Stephen returned and notified the police. All through the long hours of the night, he and Helen sat up, not saying a word, each afraid to speak, afraid of what might be said. But as the first rays of dawn showed, the doorbell rang. Stephen rushed to answer it. Mr. Hammond? Sandra. Oh, Daddy, Daddy. Darling, darling, everything's all right now. I'm the police matron from the 55th Street Station, Mr. Hamilton. One of the officers on the force just found her. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing her home. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Hamilton. It's our job. Goodbye. Goodbye. There, 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 dear. Don't cry. Oh, Daddy, it was so dark out there. And I thought I'd never see you again. Well, what a thing to say. How do you feel, Sandra? Do you want me to take a Stephen and put it to bed? No, well... 
I'll do it, Helen. All right, Stephen. Just as you say. Is she all right, Stephen? Uh-huh. She just fell asleep. I hope her being out all night won't have any after effects. Stephen, you feel I'm to blame for her running away, don't you? Of course not, Helen. It's just that... Well, you, you don't seem to understand her. But, Stephen, I've tried so hard. Oh, it's no use. She doesn't want me here, never has. Helen, how can you talk like that? Why, she was delighted the day I brought you here as my wife. Yes, I thought she was in the beginning. But now I know she was just pretending. Pretending? Yes, Stephen. From the first moment she saw me, she resented me. She feels I've come between you, taken her place in your affection. Oh, Helen, how can you say such a thing? It's true, I tell you. She sees me as a rival for your love. You're just imagining all that. I'm not, I tell you. Oh, it's no use, Steve. We can't go on this way. What do you mean? Don't you see? We aren't happy anymore. Instead of things improving, they get worse. Perhaps it would be best if we were to separate. Helen, Helen, I won't hear of it. I love you, darling. I wouldn't want to live without you. Whatever misunderstandings we may have about Sandra, I'm, I'm sure we can straighten them out. I don't know, Stephen. If you love me, Helen, you won't give up so easily. Please, say you won't leave. All right, Stephen. I won't leave. Perhaps we will be able to work this out. I hope so. Sandra? Sandra? You wake, darling? Yes, Daddy. Sandra, Mother and I were very upset when you ran away last night. Mother seems to think you ran away because you... you couldn't get along with her. She felt so badly about it, she wanted to go away. She did? Yes. But I told her how much we both loved and needed her. So she's promised to stay. Oh... I see. Sandra, you will try to be a good girl and do as Mother wants, won't you? It would make Daddy very happy. Oh, Daddy, I'd do anything to make you happy, anything. That's a good girl, darling. Now, you get up and get dressed, huh? I'll wait for you downstairs. All right, Daddy. He just doesn't understand. He should have let her go, but she's still here. And she's going to stay. I won't have it. I won't have it. I hate her. I hate her. A week passed. A week in which Sandra's behavior pleased Helen no end. At last it seemed they were going to be the happy family she had always dreamed they would be. Helen. Yes, dear? Will you bring my coat with you when you come downstairs? Sandra and I are going for a walk. All right, Stephen. I'll get it and be right down. Daddy, can we walk down to the river? Oh, we won't have enough time for that, Sandra. Stephen? Hmm? I have your coat, but I can't find your scarf. Oh, the scarf's down here, Helen. Just bring the coat. Oh, all right. Stephen, I hope... Ah! Helen! Helen! Helen, are you all right? Helen, speak to me. Daddy, is... Is she dead? No, Sandra, don't talk like that. Quick, phone Dr. Smith at once. I arrived at the Hamilton home to find Helen suffering from shock, but otherwise unhurt. I was somewhat disturbed, however, to find her very nervous and run down. She'll be all right, won't you, Doctor? Yes, of course. I'm going to leave you a prescription, Mrs. Hamilton. It's something that will help quiet your nerves. You ought to take it twice a day. Ah, here's the prescription, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Doctor. I'll have it filled at once. Well, Sandra, how are you? You've been so quiet, I hardly knew you were here. I'm fine, thank you. You're, you're growing up to be quite a young lady. Are you still troubled by nightmares? Yes, she still has them once in a while. No, it's just her nerves. Uh... If she continues to have them, you might give her some of the medicine I've prescribed for your wife. 
Doctor, I must be leaving. Goodbye, Mrs. Hamilton, and uh, stay in bed a few days. I will, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye. Doctor. Well, darling, you gave us quite a scare. Yes, I... I slipped on something on the top step. Hmm. You must have slipped on a marble, dear. I found seven or eight of them on the top step. A marble? Sandra, were they your marbles? No, Mother. They belonged to Margie. She must have left them on the stairs when we were playing here. Oh, I see. It wasn't my fault. Truly it wasn't. Of course it wasn't, Sandra. Mother knows you wouldn't leave marbles lying around where she could slip on them. Isn't that so, Ellen? Yes, Stephen. I'm sure Sandra wouldn't want anything to happen to me. Sandra, will you come into Mother's room a moment, please? Yes, Mother. The medicine that Dr. Smith prescribed for me is in the bathroom. Will you get it for me, please? All right, Mother. You'll find it in the medicine chest. It's in a blue bottle. Yes, I know what it looks like. Oh, here it is. That's fine, Sandra. Just bring it to me. Here you are, Mother. Thank you, dear. Oh, Sandra, this isn't the medicine that Dr. Smith prescribed for me. Didn't you read the label? This bottle has poison in it. Poison? Well, yes. It's right here in red letters on the label. Oh, I'm sorry, but this bottle is blue, too. It looks just like the one with your medicine. Yes, it does at that. Now, I'll put this bottle of poison back and get me my medicine. Yes, Mother. I'll have to get rid of that poison. It's too dangerous to keep in the medicine chest. Would have been awful if you took the poison, wouldn't it, Mother? Or you might have died. No, go away. I hate to. Oh, I hate to. He's mine. You shan't have him. He's mine. We don't want to. We don't want to. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Uh, You're having a nightmare. Oh, Danny. Danny. Don't leave me. Well, of course I won't, Sandra. Stephen, she's so frightened. Yes, these nightmares leave her nervous for hours. Darling, there's nothing to cry about now. Oh, Daddy, I was so frightened. Stephen, come here a moment, will you please? All right, Ellen. Oh, Daddy, don't leave me. No, no, Sandra, I'm not going to leave you. I'm just going to see what Mother wants. What is it, Ellen? Stephen, hmm? Dr. Smith said that if she had a nightmare, some of the medicine he prescribed for me would help her. Well, Sandra doesn't like taking medicine. But this medicine's very easy to take, and it'll have her asleep in no time. Uh, if you think it's best. Yes, I'm sure it is. Now, you go back to Sandra while I get the medicine and a glass. All right, Ellen. <laughs> no, Sandra. You must stop your crying. Daddy's here. Don't go away, Daddy. I want you to stay with me. Of course I'll stay with you. What were you dreaming about, dear? I, I don't know. It was all so mixed up. Oh, Daddy, will you always love me more than anybody else in the world? Of course. Now, stop your crying. All right, Stephen, I have it. Now, if you just have Sandra sit up. Come on, darling. Sit up now. That's it. What's Mother doing? She's pouring you some medicine. It'll help you sleep, darling. Medicine? Yes. It's the same medicine Mother takes for her own nurse. No! No, I don't want it! Now, please, Sandra. It'll make you feel much better. No, don't come near me. I don't want but it. Sandra, Mother takes it twice a day. There's nothing to it. No, I won't take it. I won't! Perhaps you'd better let it go, honey. Nonsense, Stephen. She'll have us up all night if she doesn't take it. Oh. Now, Sandra, stop being a baby and take this medicine. No, Daddy, don't let her make me take it. Don't let her! Sandra... <laughs> Are you going to let me give you this quietly, or do I have to make you take it? No, no, it'll kill me. I know it will. Yeah, let me hold your head. That's it. No. Now, Sandra, stop clenching your teeth. Open your mouth. Do you hear? Daddy, don't let her hurt me. There, you've taken it. All this fuss over nothing. Helen, she's talking. Daddy, Daddy, it burns. Sandra, what's wrong? Tell him, quick. Call Dr. Smith. Tell him it's an emergency. Stephen, here's Dr. Smith. Let me see her. She's been unconscious for ten minutes now. Doctor, you must do something. I'm afraid it's too late, Mr. Hamilton. She 
She's dead. Oh, no. No, she can't be. I'm sorry. But how can she be? We only gave her the medicine you prescribed for Helen. Yes, here it is. Let me see it. But this medicine wouldn't kill her. It's only a nerve tonic. You can see... Doctor, what is it? Why, this is the bottle, all right. But the medicine in it isn't the medicine I prescribed. But it is. I took some of it last night. I assure you, this isn't the medicine I prescribed. Then what is in that bottle? It smells like carbolic acid. Carbolic acid? But that's impossible. Look at the label. You can see it's my medicine. Yes, the label's right. But someone poured out the medicine I prescribed and replaced it with carbolic acid. Oh, no. But why? Why should anyone want to do such a thing? Who could possibly want to kill Sandra? Everyone loved her. Ask Helen. She'll tell you that Sandra... Stephen, why are you looking at me like that? Surely you don't believe I poisoned her. Stephen, no. No! Stephen! This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? Oh, by the way, do you have a child in your home? If so, I do trust it isn't angry with you. You can't be too careful with children. Why, I recall another child who, after being punished by his parents, took a razor and... Oh, you're getting off the next stop. I'm sorry. Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week at the same time. You've just heard Chapter 13 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Good Die Young, Betty Jane Tyler played Sandra. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple.